Okay, we are incredibly lucky to have Paul Sagan all the way from Cambridge, although I suppose to say Boston, the other Cambridge. USA. And he is not only the head of Akamai, he's also one of our distinguished co-chairs this year. So we have extra thanks for that. And he's going to do about a 20-minute, half-hour talk. And then we'll have some time for questions after. Great. And then we'll have a coffee break for those of you who are still on East Coast time and would need one of those. So with no further ado, let me roll it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Spencer. Okay. Pleasure to be here. Good morning, everybody. Everybody still awake? Kind of have that sugar curve going on. Uh, I have the uh, flyers cough, so I apologize. Um, if I cough, I, I cued the audio guy to try to be uh, respectful and not blow the speakers out. Uh, so if I cough, hopefully he'll kill the mic. Um, I thought I would talk to you about the tipping point for video on the internet, which is clearly the theme, where television and video is going, and why. After about 15 years of playing around with video on the internet, the internet video is about to become television. And we call it um, HD online. What do we mean by that? It's really when TV quality meets the internet. Now we'll get a lot of quibbles about what's the resolution? I'm going to try a demo in a few minutes of HD video online. Basically what we mean by that is the video quality over IP is as good as the television in the home to the viewer. Now, 15 years ago, a little more, I founded New York One, which is a 24-hour cable news channel, all done with prosumer technology. And I got a lot of grief from broadcast engineers back then because they said, oh, that's not good enough quality. My grandmother doesn't watch television with a scope. Nobody does. So what the viewer really cares about is, do they get a TV-like experience? They get that today from cable and satellite, and they are not going to switch without some new element. And the element is the interactivity that the internet brings. And after about 15 years of experimenting together as an industry, we are at the point where those dominoes are going to fall. And we're going to match TV picture quality with internet interactivity. And that creates the sea change for video online. That's when the television industry starts to feel the impact of the internet that music and print have suffered through so dramatically. And so for all of us in the media business, um, we have to pay attention because it's going to change production, it's going to change distribution, and it's going to change where the revenues come from and the wealth gets created. I think most of you know what Akamai does after 11 years. Many of you are customers. I had a chance to see a lot of you last night. Thank you for your business. Every day we deliver about 20% of all web traffic worldwide. So we have a pretty good sense of what's going on with internet usage patterns all around the world, and particularly what's going on with video quality. It's only been about 15 years since consumers started to get any sort of broadband into the home. In fact, the first person in the world who got an always-on broadband connection was a woman in Elmira, New York, which is a little town in upstate New York, the summer home of Mark Twain. So it was only 15 years ago that we started to play around with what could you do with broadband content. And her connection wasn't really very good. It was a little bit above dial-up, but it was faster, and it was always on. When you fast forward 15 years, we now have removed all of the blockers to doing television online, and I'm going to walk through those today. So what's the state of online video? So we've got about 700 million people today using video online worldwide. They watch about 70 to 80 streams per month per home, but they're still watching short attention span theater. They're watching generally low quality video for short duration. Most of the viewing hasn't seen the uptick that OneCast, for example, talked about. People watching TV length online. Now, the number of people using video is up. It's up about 8% year over year of internet people, internet users watching video. The number of streams per month is way up. It's up 25 to 30% year over year. And the stream length is already getting longer. If you look at, you know, if you do the math on this, you get about three to four hours per month that the average internet video consumer is watching. So they're watching about three movies in total in length, but they're still watching it in lots of little pieces. That's starting to change. The good news is for all the hype about internet video, and there's a lot of hype, including all the presentations here, including mine, the truth is there's almost no internet video being consumed today. That means we have the 99% opportunity. 
This is online video. So if you look at all the video consumed in the home, it's almost all television. Almost none of it is internet video. The good news is that rest of the pie is everything that we're going to change as an industry. So for all of the excitement about internet video, there is almost none in the real world. In the home of watching TV on the big screen, almost none is over IP. But we're about to have this gigantic cascade that follows. The same kind of thing that happened to music and the same thing that happened to print is about to happen to internet video. Now, we don't think it's about conquest of the couch, meaning just eliminate television. Television works really, really well. We don't have to just fix television. Television works really reliably. You turn it on, it's there. You change the channel, it's there. You get a high quality picture. Cable and satellite, they solve this problem. It's really about the idea of TV everywhere. What do I want, when I want it, where I want it, with lots of choice? That's what the internet adds. And it adds this three screen component, which you've heard about already from all of the demo speakers. I can get it on the big screen, that's the piece that hasn't happened. I can get it on the PC, that's the piece that's gotten pretty decent over the last few years. And I can start to get it on these mobile devices, which means I can get my entertainment, my information, my news, and my commerce wherever I want it. And these are the kinds of changes that are significant and allow us to build a new industry. And then finally, you're, we really think of it as the internet complementing television, not replacing, but complementing and changing the business models that are out there. So let's do a little timeline of video on the internet or TV online. I always get tr in trouble when I do these because I, I always leave out somebody's favorite uh, event. But I think it's worth just walking through how much has changed before we get to where we are today. So if you go back to uh, our famous internet TV event, pre Akamai, that didn't actually happen. It was the Victoria's Secret fashion show. This was taking TV to try to drive people online. So you may remember Super Bowl ad said go to the internet during the week and watch this fashion show. Didn't work. It crashed and it was just still trying to do postage stamp size video. But that started to change pretty quickly. You fast forward just a couple of years and um, actually porn wasn't the first video on the internet. It was religious programming. I think Steve's keynotes are religious programming at least in our industry. Right, so we had a cable size audience. We streamed 81,000 simultaneous viewers watching probably a 300 kilobit screen, so not a postage stamp, but still about a playing card size piece of video to a small cable network size audience. Really the first time you saw internet video start to challenge TV because it brought another channel. It brought something that none of the cable channels or cable systems or satellite systems had. It had programming, in this case religious programming, that many of us wanted to see, and it was the first time the internet demonstrated that it could be this complement to television. Then we started to see something really, really interesting in sports. Again, expanding and complementing TV. We had in um, 2004, the first time that the internet was used for live video with the Olympics under the same rules. So more events were broadcast live, but respecting all the geo rules that licensing is done for many kinds of programming, particularly the Olympics. Then we had Live Earth. We had this Follow the Sun concert, so not a single event, but 24 hours of concerts around the world broadcast globally online in 10 cities. And if we bring this chart back, something interesting is happening here in terms of the hockey stick beginning in terms of the amount of traffic required online. Am I causing you a problem? A little bit comes and goes. That won't happen with the internet piece, right? Okay. This is the canned piece. Then we had, when you fast forward just a year ago, we had TV saying, oops, I can't fulfill my mission. I need the internet's help. Because we had this giant US Open golf tournament rained out on Sunday. And so the finals went to Monday. And when that happened, we had four million streams watching an average of 17 minutes, watching the key playoff. And so television had to say, internet, help me finish my business model because my demographic audience on Sunday isn't at home Monday. I can get to them in the office. And so you had, again, this complement shifting viewing patterns. And then a great example that we all know recently, 
even with live television, with the Obama inauguration on virtually every channel, including, I think, from NBC to MTV, we had 8 million live viewers on the Internet. The audience size, or the share taken by the Internet, was the equivalent of the night, any of the three nightly newscasts in the United States. So you had the Internet now grabbing a television, broadcast television size share of live video and starting to play a very different role because of the scale of broadband and the scale of the content available. And what we're going to see now in the next few years and are beginning to is HD video over the Internet into the home. And we are already seeing some of the biggest players starting to do this taking HD quality video and making it available on demand and in some cases live events into the home. Do we lose the slides again? It's back. And these are a few of the examples. And the reason this is happening is because of this idea of HD, of TV quality video on demand available into the home. And it's starting to drive a change in the business model. And you're starting to hear about that in some of the demos earlier today. So when you grow the audience through improved quality and experience, you do this critical thing. You change the engagement model from short attention, attention span theater, which is very hard to monetize, to television-like experiences and longer views. And that's where the revenue opportunity comes. Largely an ad model, we believe. A little bit of subscription in sports, but largely an ad model. And if we think of the 1% that's TV today and the 99% that's the old-fashioned kind, the same thing happens on the ad side. And so we have this big pot that's going to move as the audience moves. So roughly $400 billion spent worldwide on advertising this year. A little more than 10% is online, so 50 million, call it. Online is less than 5%. The doubling opportunity of 1 to 2 percent of video to 2 percent to 8 percent or 10 percent and what happens with the ad dollars that move allow us to see and fund a dramatic change in the experience that we call television. It's going to become internet video because of the quality and the interactivity and the economics that flow. Except for the blockers that have prevented us from getting there. And here's some pretty simple math. If you think of the, but that Hockey stick can't continue. So today's 700 million viewers will round it up to 10 minutes a day at the average kind of bit rate that they watch. And this 2.5 terabits a second of traffic is pretty significant compared to, say, the Steve Jobs keynote broadcast of less than 10 years ago. But even that is only the equivalent of about Akamai's traffic or Google's traffic on a given day. So it's really significant, but it's manageable. That math changes in the future. So say we go to all the Internet users start to watch video online. And they don't watch the average five, six, seven hours that many people, including North Americans, watch of television. Just give them credit for a couple hours a day. And they start watching at high def bit rates. And we have an explosion of capacity that's required, a 500x increase in what has to happen and what has to be supported online. And it really leads to seven blockers that I want to talk about. And the good news is they have now all been removed or will be in the next year or two, which allows us to do HD online or television on the Internet. And these are the seven. Probably not a surprise. Probably in your businesses you've encountered them one way or the other. And I'll walk through how each is now gone. One is last mile connectivity. If you remember that woman in Elmira, New York, 15 years ago, she could not watch any video, even though we advertised it as broadband and always on. She could just send email pretty quickly. There was no way to get this thing called the Internet onto the big screen that we call the TV very conveniently. Only a few geeks could wire them up. That changes. There wasn't any HD content. That's starting to change. The middle mile bottleneck, which is the inherent structure of the Internet, stops people from pushing large amounts of data reliably in real time from where the content is today to where the user wants it. Huge cost of HD. Think of these scaling bit rates and how do you pay for this, especially until the ad dollars flow over. It's too complicated to make this work, even with some of the great solutions that people have been talking about this morning. And in the end, for the consumer to change from 1% to 10% or 20% or 50% of video online, it has to act like a television set. So what's happened here? If you go over what's happened with broadband connectivity, in the last mile over the last five years, this blocker is now 
falling. So we spend a lot of time delivering content. We respond to 500 billion requests a day on the Akamai network. So we have a pretty good idea of who has what level of connectivity around the world. And if you look in North America, we've gone from this 500 kilobit, so not even the 700K stream that most sites try to do at the high end, today an average bandwidth of the home of four megabits. You can now do television this way. We see something similar across most of Europe. Some variability, but again, we've now crossed that threshold of one or two megs that allow you to do real video. And Asia, as we all hear, is ahead, and that actually comes out in the numbers that we see. So this first blocker is now gone. It doesn't mean every user all the time, but it means on average, most of the users at home in particular now have the bandwidth to get television-like video. The next is connected devices. Five years ago, there were no com commercially connected devices. We would call them, and the users would call them a set-top box. How do I get television onto the big screen? Well, that now changes. There are 54 million devices today in the home, whether they're gaming consoles or Apple TVs. Now, the challenge is there's still a second set-top or a third set-top box. Most consumers don't want that at all. And that will change in the TV replacement cycle over the next five years as TVs are shipped not just with an Ethernet connection, which is still not the way most people want to watch. My grandmother, as I said, doesn't watch TV with a scope, and she doesn't watch with cables running around the room. But we're going to have Wi-Fi-enabled television shipping for this Christmas season, and a Wi-Fi-enabled TV set with a little storage and some processing is suddenly um, another computer device fully capable of doing HD video in the home. There also wasn't any HD content. People weren't encoding at those rates. That's now changing. Epix, for example, which we just launched with last week, is doing full DVD quality video over to the home to Fios consumers, for example. So if you're already paying for, for the Fios service, you get a login that allows you over the internet anywhere to watch a full selection of movies in HD. We're starting to see players like MLB deliver HD games on subscription to iPhones and on and on. So we're seeing the change of there has to be something to watch. Then the shameless pitch Akamai piece of this is the bit about how do we get all those bits from where you have the content to the edge. Well, the traditional network model is hosted, and it tries to jam the content from the big pipe in the data center through the middle of the internet, which is actually 13,000 different ISPs using peering and BGP, which we know is a pretty crummy low-level protocol, to move data, and it leads to stuttering breakup and poor performance. And so it leads off into this cry we hear. In fact, I hear it more often in Europe than in North America, which is the internet won't scale for video. It simply can't work. There are no economics. The technology won't work. Well, there is a pretty easy answer, which is deliver the content from the other side of the internet. Deliver it from inside the ISP, where the capacity of the internet is the sum of the last miles. That's always been our philosophy. We spent 11 years deploying servers and technology into 1,000 networks in 2,000 locations in 70 countries. So when we think of delivering content, including video, it's from down here. It's from the edges directly into the home. And that's how you can get actual throughput that equals the measured throughput that we see into those homes. And the next, and it's a big one, and it's been a problem for years in the delivery of web content, particularly rich media, and that's the cost problem, which is it's so darn expensive. Right, we finally got to the point with sort of standard definition video in short form where the revenue opportunity exceeded the cost. What I always hear on HD is, wait a minute, we're going to go from 300 kilobit, 500, 7 bit, 700 kilobit to 1, 2, 3, 4 megs. Um, if we think about this as hours viewed, the number of bits, the transfer is enormous. How do we pay for it? Well, what we believe is that as we move to edge delivery and significantly with video, the industry moves to HTTP off of individualized proprietary protocols and servers, the cost will compress dramatically. If you look at the cost of delivering a movie at some scale on average, say five years ago, it was probably five dollars a movie or three euros. If you fast forward to today, it's probably 50 cents US, 30 cents European. And we think that's going to fall, whoops, dramatically again to probably a nickel U.S. or a few cents to deliver a movie in the next five years. So we're going to have a hundredfold decrease in the cost of delivery 
while the number of bits go up dramatically. So we think that the cost structure is going to change so fast that it will allow programmers to push high def, long form, and support it with advertising going forward. So think of that. Over a decade, a hundred fold reduction in price from five dollars to five cents. Next problem is the lack of simplicity. The blocker problem of how many formats and how many bit rates do I have to create? And this is the content provider's problem today. So all of these formats, all of these bit rates, to all of these devices across all of these ways of delivery. Different ISPs, different relationships, unbelievably complicated for the programmer. Will not scale, will not last. That changes because of two things. Adaptive bit rate technology, which is now standard and improving every day and using HTTP rather than proprietary protocols. And when you do that, you'll get a world where you ultimately will use one um, mezzanine file delivered to a delivery network, and it will on the fly transcode the video to any format you want to support, so any of the features that you want to use through the tools that you've used to create the content. And then at any bit rate, from really crummy to an end user on a poor mobile connection, to full HD across someone with great broadband connectivity. So you'll get one movie produced, one file ingested to any device anywhere at any bit rate around the world. And then the seventh blocker, because all this is great, but that's just technology in the background and economics that our customers, the end users, don't care about at all, is will it perform like TV? So HD quality, the picture better look about the same. Real time, it has to work for live and it can't be delayed because one of the things you want to do with interactivity is switch camera angles, for example, that we're now seeing broadcasters do. Fast switching, well, it's like a remote control. I'm watching it on the big screen. It better work like TV. And finally, DVR functionality. That's now standard. If you remember my pie chart from the beginning, if we've got 1% on internet video, and we have, I think, 20 times that is DVR viewing, live DVR viewing. So not just time shifting and zapping out commercials, but just playing around and doing instant replay on sports. So the internet has to do all of these things. The good news is all seven of these blockers are now gone or falling. Last mile connectivity, not a problem in most places. Connected to device adoption, happening because of consoles and new forms of TVs coming. HD content becoming more and more standard. And then these other four being taken care of by network solutions like Akamai's. And when you do all of these, you're now in a position to do HD online. And so flying a little bit without a net, I want to show you what that really looks like. So we're going to go out to the internet live. And we're going to take a look at HD video. And what you see here is the system adjusting in real time using variable bit rate. And delivering television. So no more postage stamp video. Live or on demand video delivered over the internet using HTTP and variable bit rate in any format you want. functionality. So you want to go back, 
you just click and it rewinds instantly. And it's because it's done with HTTP. So you're just getting little bits from an Edge server anywhere in the world. So anytime you want to jump around or watch the play again, if it's a live game, it just does it for you. So you have a completely different experience over the internet using video. And so for the consumer now, they have a completely different experience. They have an experience that's like television. And so I think we've reached this tipping point. So you can now do television over IP. You can do DVR functionality. You can do switching between cameras. So there's no lag. There's no delay. It matches the live picture quality coming over a cable or satellite at HD with a series of other cameras that the user can pick. And so they get this additive complementary experience. We're now doing one NFL game a week live that way. So you have a completely different television experience which changes the engagement model and the monetization model. So it's a reality today. It goes everywhere. This same design allows you to go to the big screen, to the medium-sized screen, to the iPhone, or the other portable device, because you can use adaptive bitrate streaming there. You can sense the device. You can change the form factor and transcode it again at the edge because you're doing it in HTTP. And we don't think television is going to be the same. And we think that as exciting as this business has been in the last 10 years, or 15 if you go back to that first woman in Elmira, we've only gotten to 1%. And so, Spencer, we've got 99% more to go, and we think it's going to make for some pretty exciting change going forward. Thank you very much. Um, we're running a little behind, so we're not going to have a lot of time. For, but I had one really obvious one. Is television, big television, the networks, the broadcasters, are they ready for this? I think they're worried a lot. I think everybody's worried a lot. We've seen what happened to music, and that industry changed a lot, and wealth got moved. Right. We're seeing it dramatically in print, and we're going to see the same thing in television. So the people who are putting up HD content today are the biggest broadcasters around the world in the biggest sports league. Right. But the model is going to change, and everybody's pretty worried about that. Now, we think that there's an opportunity to move the audience and move the revenue with it and not have the analog dollars going to digital nickels problem. Right. But it's going to take a lot of focus by people and a lot of guts, because if you wait, the industry is just going to go. And we're seeing that in some of the examples that you had up here this morning. Um, what was, I couldn't read in the little dot, what kind of bitrate did you have here? Did you, could you so see? So I think what we were getting, was that 6.8 megabits, right? No, we, no, 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 we, we, the, the maximum bandwidth into here was, was about 15 megs, and so I think we were getting probably a two and a half meg stream, because it adjusts up and down, and I think the highest bitrate that the BBC video is in is two and a half megs, and so we were probably, you're actually getting a two and a half meg stream, which will give you a, 780 uh, or better resolution picture, which is HD. So in fact, what we were getting here is comparable to a home yep. in US, Europe, nothing special. Well, we think it's pretty special, but yes, okay, you yes. can now okay. get it around but, I mean, the world. You, we, you could have done this in my house. You, much more easily in your house, because I, I know you're popular, Spencer, but you probably don't have 150 of your friends okay. all blogging and doing other things, sucking up your bandwidth. Ah, at the same so you're time. sharing. You're We're sharing. sharing. We're trying to share nicely here, yeah. But that's the other thing. So, so if I've got two people in my house, each of them watching something different, then what happens? Depending on what your connection right. is, we're probably going to dial it back dynamically. But you're not going to know it as a user. You're still going to get a TV like. So we're going to hope that one of them is watching The Simpsons while the other is watching the BBC Earth. And that yeah, that way. would be good. They're both customers, so that'd be okay. <laughs> okay.